Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. It is a wonderful morning this morning and it is great to see you all here. Welcome to worship in Bridge of Allen Parish Church this Trinity Sunday. Be you always here or be it your first time, you are welcome. If you are listening on the web or the CD, you are welcome. Welcome into this community of faith. Welcome into this community of love. If you are visiting this morning, please say hello to somebody. And if you are here often and don't recognize somebody, please say hello to them. Of course, all conversations can be continued over tea and coffee in the Chalmers Hall after the service. I apologise, there are a few intimations this morning. Um, I'll try to be quick with them. Next week, as most of you are aware, little baby Zoe is going to be baptised. It's, it's odd to think that I now have a month-old baby. Um, it's odd to think she's not hugely old. She seems to have been here forever. Um, but next week, she's going to be baptised, and there are going to be sandwiches and cake and sausage rolls and things through in the Chalmers suite afterwards. We'd be delighted for everyone and anyone who is here to come and join us in celebrating. To help with catering, I know some of you will already sort of put a name down. There is some paper and a pen just before you get into the Chalmers suite. If you think you might be able to are coming, you could put your name down and some numbers, that's okay. That's not to say if your name wasn't down, you're not getting in. Or if your name was down and we don't see you, we'll chase you up afterwards just to get an idea of numbers. As, again, many of you will be aware, it is the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland this week. I have the privilege of being a commissioner uh, alongside Carol Kirkpatrick, one of our elders. And yesterday there was a very significant debate, and it is with pleasure I can read to you the following. The historic decision by the Church of Scotland to recognise ministers and deacons in same-sex civil partnerships has been extended to cover same-sex marriage. Commissioners decided by 339 votes to 215 to update church law to keep pace with Scots law. For clarity, it is worth noting that the decision does not mean the decision made does not compromise the church's traditional view of marriage as a union between one man and one woman. And it does not mean church ministers will be able to register same-sex civil partnerships or solemnize same-sex marriages themselves. It is a historic and good decision, in my opinion, that the church has made. And we will see in the future if and when other decisions are made. But of course, they will be made by General Assembly. They will be made by the people of God in the Church of Scotland prayerfully and carefully. There are lots of other decisions to be made at the General Assembly this week and next Sunday I will report back on some of those that have been made as well. This afternoon as part of the General Assembly there is the Heart and Soul event in Princes Street Gardens in Edinburgh and it's a great social activity it is a great way to meet people from churches around Scotland and around the world, seeing all the wonderful things that go on. And it concludes with a huge communal worship at the bandstand in Princes Street Gardens. So if any of you are planning on going to Edinburgh, or even fancy an afternoon sharing with people of the church across Scotland and the world, then it is a wonderful and exciting thing to be part of. So I would commend that to you. If the weather holds and Zoe seems happy enough, certainly we will be making our way across. That's almost all the intimations. I'd like to draw your attention to those that are in the print, but in addition to that, I'd like to invite Linda forward. Good morning. As many of you will already know, the church is starting up a new faith-based youth initiative, and it'll be starting in June. 
The sessions will take place on Friday evenings from 7 until 8.30 and is open to all young people in Primary 7. After the summer, um, the group will welcome the new Primary 7s along with the Primary 7s who have now moved up into first year. This is a completely new project for the church. It is a project where young people can gather and learn about the Bible and Christian faith through fun and interactive learning experiences in a safe and relaxed environment. After speaking with the Primary 7s at Bridge of Allen Primary, I realised that many of the young people want to find out more about the Christian faith in general and about the church, the building that they see, but they walk past. The young people made it really clear that as it stands, they do not have the opportunity to find out more. The only time many of the children are in the church is for school services. Our new project will encourage the young people to positively engage with the church while giving them the opportunity to explore the Christian faith. Hopefully in time, the young people will start to feel more comfortable and secure enough in the church to engage more in church life and attend Sunday worship. But this will not just happen on its own. Getting the young people in our community to positively engage with the church is vital for the future of the church and we need everybody who is part of this church to help. Whether you're sitting here today worshipping with us through the CD ministry or through our podcasts, we need you. We need your support, we need your prayers and we need your compassion. We all know there are barriers stopping young people coming to church and it's time we do something to change that. If you're involved in a group, please come and speak to me. I would really like to have one evening where the members of our church come to the youth club and let the young people know what actually happens in here. The young people see this as a building that people go to on a Sunday morning. They have no idea about the other wonderful work that goes on in and around the church. I could tell them, I could tell them most of what goes on in the church, but that will not help break down the invisible barriers that prevent them from engaging in the life of the church. Our young people need to get to know the members of this church and realise that church offers something for everyone and that they too are welcome to be part of the church's family. Additionally, we need people who can help out on a Friday evening. If you can play board games, bake, do arts or crafts, knitting, chat, listen, read Bible stories, kick a ball, play sporty games, or help with walks or outings, or most importantly, just be there to offer some compassion to others, then please come and meet our young people. Volunteers are essential to the successful running of Friday evening groups. We have a rota where people can choose to help out every so often or just do a one-off evening. Many people don't know if they would feel comfortable interacting with young people. If that is the case, then please let me know. Sometimes we do need to step out of our comfort zone to make sure God's work gets done. You would be more than welcome to pop down for 10 minutes one evening and engage as much or as little as you feel comfortable with and just see what happens. Whether you can support the group practically or not, please remember in your prayers the work that we are doing here in the church and the young people in our community who desperately need to know that God loves them. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Let us take a moment as we prepare to worship Almighty God. Come to God, come to the Father, come to the Son, come to the Spirit. Come one and all, together as companions, together as God's beloved, together in worship. Come and worship a God who is always with us, a God who will never leave us, a God who is constant in all our lives. Come into worship, together as one. We stand as we are able singing together hymn 147, all creatures of our God and King. <laughs>
please be seated. We now come to our prayers of praise and confession. Praise to God and confession of the things we have got wrong. Like maybe singing all seven verses of a beautiful hymn. Let us pray. God our Father, present with us in all circumstances, we gather to praise you today as your mixed body of believers. Some of us have gathered fresh from a week of achievement and success, others from a week of trouble and distress. Together we celebrate and commiserate as one seeking to support our brothers and sisters in Christ in the roller coaster of life, this earthly pilgrimage through the highs and lows of our journey. Where one laughs, together we share the joy. Where one of us cries, together we share the pain. One body, one people, one church. As you exist in sacred relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so we worship one with each other no matter what. Happy or sad, energetic or tired, enthused or frustrated, inspired or discouraged. Help us to pray with each other, with feeling, with empathy, with thoughtful love. Help us to sing with each other, with sensitivity, with care, with awareness of all. Help us to listen to each other, with ears to hear and hearts to feel. O oh Lord, our God, we ask it in your name. We confess our need of you, as we confess our need of human fellowship too. In this church, let us be open to love of all varieties, human and divine. We confess that we turn from you, doing for ourselves rather than loving ourselves. Just doing for others rather than loving others. Doing a little rather than loving a lot. As we confess, we know you forgive. As we confess, we know you reconcile us to you and to each other. And as a reconciled, reconciled people, we pray together the radical prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. How are you all this morning? Good. That's good. Can anybody notice anything this morning? Yep. There's, there's a thing there. Can anybody see what it is? Do you think you can see what it is, Oscar? It says Beano on it. It says Beano on it. If I bring it a bit closer, do you think you'll be able to? It's a Beano tin. Any, can anyone see what sort of Beano tin it is? No, I don't think you can. Yep. It's, it's got Dennis the Menace on the front. Dennis the Menace and Nasher. There's something written across the top. First aid kit. You doubt it's a first aid kit? So if I open this up and it's got a first aid kit in it, will you be surprised? Really? So that's a wee bandage, and that's a, a triangular bandage. That seems to be some sort of sling, some sort of alcoholic wipes, some pads of some sort, a box of plasters with monkeys on them. So 
So I, I, it's not a very good first aid kit, but I think it still counts as a first aid kit. What would we use a first aid kit for? J just, sh just shout out answers. <laughs> Yeah? What? Somebody burned their hand. Um, because this isn't a very good first aid kit, it doesn't have burn stuff in it, but a good one does. You're right. Yep. They hurt themselves. If they kind of fall over and skin their knee, I think one of the monkey plasters would help with that. Oscar? If you cut yourself. Um, I very often do the chopping of food in our house. And Kirsty will sometimes talk to me when I'm chopping onions. And I won't do the sensible thing of stopping chopping. I'll turn my head and keep chopping. So I, I have a, a big scar in my thumb there. And that required a lot of plasters. But yeah, if you cut yourself. So the rule of that is if you are cutting, stop if somebody talks to you. Yep. If you break your arm, you need more than that first aid kit. <laughs> um, but the sling, the sling would help. The sling would maybe help. But the first thing to do if you break your arm is to go to the hospital and get it fixed, not rely on the Beano to fix it for you. Okay, so these are kind of physical things. But sometimes when we hurt, it, it's not because we've cut our finger or our little thumb or it's not a broken arm. Sometimes we can kind of hurt inside. Something's happened that makes us a bit sad or a bit upset. So what do we do then? Yeah? Call Childline. Call Childline, maybe? Yeah, that's a, if it's something fairly serious, or it feels fairly serious, that might be a thing to do. But we kind of speak to people, don't we? You kind of try to talk to somebody. And if you see a friend who's hurting, you're sort of hurting on the inside from something that's happened or something somebody said to them, you go and give them a hug and try to comfort them in some way. And if it's something very serious, you do have to get other people involved, and that's good and that's right. We're going to read in the Bible in a short while an extract of a letter by a chap called Paul to the church in Corinthians. And in that... Paul talks about comforting other people and how God comforts us and when we comfort other people when they hurt, that we are doing the work of God. So maybe when, actually no, very truly, when we comfort people when they've cut their finger or they've skinned their knee or they've broken their arm, when we're helping them with that, that is comforting and that is good. But also when people are hurting on the inside when they're sad, when they're upset, maybe when they just kind of feel a bit funny and they don't quite know what's wrong, but they're certainly not okay. When we're comforting them in that, we are doing the stuff of God. We comfort because God comforts us in the same way that we kind of can know love because God loves us first. It's important to remember in all of this, we all need that comfort too. We can't just give it to other people. We have to be open to receiving it. We have to accept that we need help sometimes. So as we think about that and we think about connecting with God and God's comfort and the people of God, we stand as we are able and we sing, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer.
Let us pray together. Let us pray. It's us, Lord. We're in the need of prayer. Comfort us in our hurt. Allow us to allow others to comfort us in our hurt. And help us to comfort our mothers and our fathers and our brothers and our sisters and our grannies and our granddads and all those who take care of us. All our neighbours, all our friends, those who we don't know and those who we've never met. Comfort us, Lord, and help us to comfort other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, reading at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his people throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered from us such a deadly peril, but he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. We sing once more, standing as we are able, singing together hymn 528, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
to make up for the seven-verse hymn at the beginning of the service, I shall only preach for about 45 minutes, not my usual hour. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Today in the liturgical calendar, in the calendar of the church year, it is Trinity Sunday. It is the first Sunday after Pentecost, and the day where we particularly think about God being one, but also God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's probably helpful for me to quickly explain what we mean in the church by the Trinity, or the triune nature of God, but also a bit about maybe what this doesn't mean. This, of course, is a hugely complicated and lengthy topic, and it's caused much controversy and heresy in the church since the church began. I'm going to try to briefly explain what the broadly orthodox view is in only a couple of minutes. <laughs> and hopefully not have myself under the discipline of presbytery for being a heretic in the process. Firstly and simply what the Trinity is not. When we talk about God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we are not talking about three different gods who all work together. We are not talking about some sort of polytheism where different gods perform different functions. But what can we say about the Trinity? We can say that the Father is not the Son, and that the Son is not the Spirit, and that the Spirit is not the Father. But what we can say is that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. We can say that God is one, and we can say that Father, Son, and Spirit are all completely and indivisibly part of that oneness. I told you it was complicated. We are not talking about each making up a third or being different in nature from each other. So the easiest that we can put this, and this is very complicated, is God is one God, but three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Singular in nature and character, but plural in person. Distinguishable yet indivisible. This is one of those situations where all the words I've just said make sense, but in that context, maybe don't make much sense at all. In trying to find a simple way of explaining it, I found a short blog entry by a minister from South Carolina called Andy Gill, who wrote, J. Gerhard, a 17th century theologian, said that, We know God, but we do not comprehend him. Meaning, God cannot be defined or ever fully understood. God's incomprehensible, yet through divine revelation, that being the power and given knowledge of the Holy Spirit, God and Jesus Christ are revealed to us. As, our limit, as limited as our knowledge and capability to comprehend the holy can be, I think we must try. We must seek, and in our effort, that is when we find and encounter this divine revelation, that being Jesus Christ. So I don't know. I guess. I just want to encourage those that are frustrated and discouraged and doubting God or the existence or understanding of a divine being to keep searching, asking, talking, praying and seeking. You are not alone in this. I'm right there with you in the confusion of it all. I'm right there with you in the confusion of it all.
So with the Trinity explained in a way that is not neat or hugely comprehensive, and if anybody would like to talk to me further about what Trinity is or is not, please email me and I will send you rafts and rafts of paperwork that have challenged the church for nearly 2,000 years. And of course, be happy to discuss all of it with you, if you forgive my head scratching as well. So with that, not neat or hugely comprehensive, let us move into the biblical reading we had today. Suffering is very much a part of the opening chapter of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. He might have said he was suffering for my part, in the sense that his role as an apostle for the church and apologist for the faith was hardly a bed of roses and brought with it considerable discomfort. While elsewhere in his New Testament writings, Paul can seem rather aloof. Here he is achingly human. He's been having a dreadful time, but is seeing his own painful experience as nonetheless a source of reflective teaching on the consolation of faith. That he writes out of weakness rather than strength makes his message all the more persuasive and all the more encouraging. Paul declares his vulnerable hand, but not thereby to wallow in some sort of strange self-pity, but precisely to offer consolation to others who may be surprised to find themselves suffering. Maybe they think, surely faith offers some protection. But of course we know it does not. Paul's affliction then is not failure. It is nothing more or less than suffering for his part. And so encouraging others not to lose heart when they find themselves similarly afflicted. In this, he is alongside the people to whom he is writing. And it's this idea of alongside that is a powerful reflection for the mystery of the Trinity. That is God as one and God as three. Paul is encouraging the followers at Corinth when they suffer for their part. That they are in fact doing their part in the work of God. In doing so, Paul demonstrates that he is alongside them in the joys and the challenges they faith, face. This saving notion of alongside precisely reflects the heart of the truth of the Trinity. All of this points to a possibly stark and difficult realisation. That is, belief in God, trying to follow the teachings of Jesus and allowing ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit does not lead to any sort of get-out-of-jail free card or freedom from suffering. What it does mean that when we are suffering or imprisoned by fear or pain or hurt or whatever it might be, we are not alone. When it is dark and all feels lost, our Trinitarian God sits with us in the darkness and lights a flame of hope. A flame that burns within us and within those who try to follow God, those whom we share community or encounter on the way. Those who are looking in the dark and difficult corners, who are going out of their way to sit with those who are struggling, not offering quick fixes or platitudes, but offering companionship and acceptance. They are the folk who get the accompanying nature of our triune God. That's not to say we are free to sit in the darkness and ask why we cannot see the light. When we sit with the lost and the hurting, we should be looking for and pointing to the sparks of hope, the light of Christ. And these sparks should compel us 
into loving folk where they are and trying to help them in tangible and real ways. To the hungry, God does not say, you look starving, you should eat. God says and encourages us to say, I know what it's like to be hungry. Let us go eat. To the lost, God does not say, you look confused, go and find your way. God says and encourages us to say, I know what it's like to be lost. Let us find a way together. To the hopeless, God does not say, you look at your wit's end, but you could have it worse. No, God says and encourages us to say, I know what it's like to be hopeless. Let us cry out together. So in all of this, we are encouraged to echo the nature of God. Echo the nature of the Trinity and live our life and faith as people who get alongside, who join together and work with each other to find solutions and offer companionship. God gets beside us and with us. So our challenge is to get beside and with each other, to offer empathy to each other, to ask the hard questions of systematic injustice and to the offer the light of love in the darkness of suffering. Amen. We stand as we are able, singing together hymn 253, inspired by love and anger.
be seated. <laughs> Apologies for having almost another mammoth hymn. <laughs> Our offering for the work of the church, both at home and abroad, will be uplifted. As the choir just sang for each new morning, we give thanks. Let us dedicate our offering and lift our prayers for the world. Let us pray. Spirit of God, we give what we can for your kingdom's purposes. Take what we offer to help heal the hurting, to bind up the broken hearts, to offer care and compassion especially where care and compassion are lacking. Our offerings we bring in the name of our God of Trinity. God who meets us in our suffering, we pray. In words we pray, in silence we pray, in sorrow we pray for the suffering, hurting world. Sometimes, Lord, we just don't have the words. Where children die, where individuals receive terrible news, where our brothers and sisters in humanity scare or starve or shiver in this often harsh, harsh world. We feel some of their pain and we seek to carry some of it now with them. We look to you because we believe you care. We look to you because we hope you will hear us. We look to you because we ache for help and healing in the face of this world's tragedies and traumas. And we long that all would be well. So for those in our midst who are suffering today, we take a moment to remember them. For those in our wider church who are suffering today, we take a moment to remember them. For those in our wider world who are suffering today, we take a moment to remember them.
for those who feel the impact of the plane crash near Egypt. We take a moment to remember them. For those who are making decisions at our General Assembly. For those appointed to new office particularly for Dr. Barr, our new moderator. For those who would seek inclusion. For those who seek unity in the face of disagreement. For all those involved in the courts of your church, we ask you guide them and equip them for what is to come. in the silence or with our words, we reach out to you on behalf of others in need. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. We draw our service to a close, standing together and singing hymn 622. We sing a love that sets all people free. God bless us as we go in hope together. God bless us as we share the road together. God bless us as we walk in trust together. God bless us in his footsteps, in his fellowship, through his faith in us. Be blessed, and may the peace of Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storms. 
May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once more into his arms. 